Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about how we deal with the concept of momentum in quantum mechanics, as well as where it all actually comes from. If you enjoyed this video then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content, let's get into it. Now, many of us are probably familiar with the concept of momentum in classical physics. The momentum of an object is given by multiplying the mass of an object by its velocity. And this is all well and good, but how do we find an object's momentum in the theory of quantum physics? After all, in this theory we deal with wave functions. These are essentially mathematical functions that contain all the information we can know about our system. For example, our system could be a particle such as an electron, and we could find the wave function of the electron, which would tell us about the probability of us finding our electron at different points in space. Or with a simple mathematical transformation, usually not that simple, we could get the wave function to tell us the probability of finding our electron with different values of momentum. If you want to find out more about wave functions, what they are and what they do, then check out this video up here. But what we're seeing here is that unless we make a measurement on our particle, we cannot say with certainty where it is or what speed or momentum it's moving with. We can only know the probability of finding it in different places and with different momentum values. This idea is different to classical physics, of course, because if we measure a classical object, say a ball, at some point in time, and then we stop measuring it, we can still predict or calculate exactly where and how fast it's moving based on the laws of classical physics. However, in quantum physics, we unfortunately cannot be quite so precise. What we can say is we know the range of the different positions and velocities with which we might find our particle, and we know the probabilities with which we might find it in each one of these possible states. But let's remember that whenever we do end up making a measurement on any system in quantum mechanics, we cause the wave function to collapse into one of the possible states. For a short amount in time, we cause the particle to have one single value for whatever it is that we're measuring, and thus we know that value exactly. But then, as time passes, the wave function begins to evolve and change over time once again, following what is known as the Schrodinger equation, this is the equation that determines how wave functions change over time. The thing that I really want to focus on in this video though, is how we mathematically encode momentum in quantum mechanics. In classical physics it's easy, mass of object multiplied by its velocity, but in quantum physics the maths primarily deals with wave functions. So where does momentum come into the picture? Well, in the maths of quantum physics, we say that we apply a measurement operator to our wave function in order to give us what we would measure in an experiment. This equation here is known as an eigenvalue equation, which shows that when we apply a measurement operator to our wave function, the eigenvalue, which is what we get on the right hand side, or at least one of the things we get on the right hand side of this equation, is the value that we actually end up measuring when we do the experiment in real life. So if we want to find a measurement for the momentum of a particle, mathematically speaking, we apply the momentum operator to our wave function, and then we find out what the experimental result may be. Now this is a bit of a simplification of the mathematics that's actually going on, but I've made a more detailed video discussing the eigenvalue equation, which you can check out up here if you're interested. So for this video, let's focus on what the momentum measurement operator looks like, mathematically speaking. Does it look as simple as m times v? The answer to that is no. The momentum operator looks something like this, minus i h bar d by dx. So what on earth is going on? Why is there a minus sign and the imaginary number i? Well, all of this comes from the fact that mathematically speaking, we apply the operator to a wave function, the wave function of our particle, rather than dealing with the particle itself directly. Now, a simple wave, one of the simplest kinds of waves that we talk about in quantum mechanics, has a mathematical form that looks like this. Already looks pretty complicated, but don't worry. E is the exponential function, and if you're familiar with the exponential function, then you might think that it looks like this, or this, depending on the sign of the exponent. Now this looks nothing like a wave, right? Well the thing is, this quantity i, which is the imaginary number taken to be the square root of negative 1, is what turns this quantity into a wave. In fact, sinusoidal functions such as sine and cosine 
can be written in terms of the exponential function with i in the exponent. More information on this in the description below, and I'll make a video on this at some point as well. So basically, exponential function by itself, yes, it doesn't look like a wave, but e to the power of i something does look like a wave. Now, in this expression, p is talking about the momentum of the particle, the particle for which this is the wave function, and this momentum is, of course, in the x direction because we're only looking at the particle's motion in one direction just to keep things simple. x is, of course, the position along the x direction. e is the particle's energy, and t is time. Again, all of this refers to a very specific type of wave, the kind of wave that looks like this expression here. But the good thing is that we can even take a weird looking wave function that is indeed, you know, a solution to the Schrodinger equation and follows all other wave function rules. And we could take that wave function and break it down into lots of different simple waves that have this form. So whatever mathematics we're about to do next in this video, which again won't be too complicated hopefully, we can imagine taking a complicated wave, much more difficult wave function, breaking it down into lots of these simpler wave chunks or building blocks, and then applying the same maths to each one of these simple building blocks in order to get a similar result to what we'll see shortly. Now, for those of you familiar with differentiation, we can find the derivative of this wave function with respect to x. Don't worry if you don't know what differentiation is, I'll talk about that in a minute. But for now, let's say that we're finding the partial derivative of this wave function with respect to x. This means that we assume nothing else apart from x depends on x. Partial differentiation is an interesting idea that isn't necessarily taught when you first learn about differentiation. Even though it's mathematically easier, it's conceptually more difficult. So again, resources in the description box below if you want to find out more. And of course, for those of you that are not familiar with differentiation in the first place, one thing that we need to know is that it's a mathematical process that allows us to find the gradient of our wave or whatever function we differentiate at each point, in this case, in the x direction. So we can take our wave, differentiate it, and the end result will tell us the gradient at every single point. Really though, we aren't even bothered about finding out the gradient here. The only reason we're differentiating our function is because we find out that the end result is p, the momentum, multiplied by some other stuff, including the original wave function itself. This means we can rearrange this last equation to solve for the momentum p, which ends up looking like this. This is where our mathematical formulation of momentum comes from in the world of quantum mechanics. But what we're seeing here is that momentum in quantum mechanics is a little bit more complicated than we're used to. It's not as simple as calculating the velocity of our object and then multiplying it by its mass like we do in classical physics. We have to take this complicated operator with a negative sign and the imaginary number and then apply it to any wave function that corresponds to our particle or whatever we're studying. When we do this mathematics, this is equivalent to making a real life measurement of our particle's momentum. Though that is a complex process that deserves a video of its own. My main aim here though is to show how the momentum operator in quantum mechanics looks so different to the basic momentum equation that we're used to in classical physics and to give you some understanding of why this looks so different. Again, a lot of everything I've discussed here needs to be covered in much more detail, so let me know in the comments down below which bits you have questions about and I'd love to make some more videos on this topic. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please do check out my merch linked in the description below. It has a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And lastly, I want to say a huge thank you to all of my Giga patrons and all of my other patrons over on Patreon. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you as always for your support and I will see you very soon.